Variety of its landscape and diversity of its peoples. Welcome to Travelog's Ethnic Minority Special again. And if you look at the site behind me, you see these multicolored rainbow. They're like prayer flags that are dancing in the wind. And in my opinion, this is the most spectacular sight you could find anywhere. If you're familiar with this, you'll know that we are in one of the centers of Tibetan culture. That's Yushu in Qinghai province. And it is here that we will experience the nomadic lifestyle of the Tibetans. We'll see them rushing through the plateau on their horses, charging at the emptiness. And also, we'll hear their beautiful songs and dance. Welcome to Travelogue. I'm Yin. And get ready for an unforgettable experience. Qinghai province is a land of marvel and mystery. In its remotest areas, you can find some of the most culturally rich regions where Tibetans live. Our journey starts in the provincial capital, Xining, from where we'll head to Yushu to celebrate the famed horse racing festival. The Qinghai Tibet Plateau is home to communities of nomadic Tibetans, with their long history, rich culture, and religious devotion. Despite living in a harsh, high-altitude environment, Tibetans are famous for their sprightly nature and vivacious culture. The spirit of the Kangba Tibetans permeates their energetic songs, bold dances, strikingly bright faces, and wild horse races. The most typical image of these people is that of men and women dressed in bold colors, racing across the grassland on horseback. The road from Xining to Yushu is 800 kilometers long, taking us past the famous Qinghai Lake, which Qinghai Province is named after. It's the largest saltwater lake in China, whose scenery is so beautiful that people believe it's blessed by heaven. It's the right season, you can get a glimpse of endless rows of race flowers. Qinghai Lake is known variously as the Green Lake, Blue Sea, and fairyland, names that describe its changing shades at different times of day, in different seasons, and when viewed from different angles. The locals call the lake their mother lake, and they hold ceremonies here to make sacrifices to the lake god. Before the arrival of Tibetan Buddhism, the indigenous religion was Ban and involved the worship of mountains, forests, and bodies of water. The sacrificial ceremonies around Qinghai Lake are a lingering legacy of Ban. The path to Yushu leads further on to Tibet. The history of the road is intertwined with the story of the beautiful Tang Dynasty princess. Princess Wencheng, who traveled along this route to marry the Tibetan king Song Zan Ganbo. Here, the natural environment provides a habitat for some rare animals. In particular, is the rare Tibetan antelope. Though rarely seen, it's a symbol of the wildlife of the Qinghai Tibet Plateau, with its strength of body, grace, and free spirit. Busted a, a tire here. I think we crossed over a rock over there and, and we sort of put over the rock. Shrimp, make sure about that. All we have to do is now a quick little change up. We got an extra spare in the back and uh, soon we'll be out of this emptiness to somewhere. A journey like ours is hard work. While the high altitude makes us dizzy and short of breath, the tough roads take their toll on our vehicle. But the journey continues. On this unending grassland, 
The sides of the road are dotted with lakes, big and small. Yushu is sometimes called the source of rivers, namely the Yellow River, the Yangtze River, and the Lanzhang. Now, since ancient times, the Yellow River has nurtured Chinese civilization. The source of the river is 4,600 meters above sea level, and there are plenty of natural barriers. Even so, you may be surprised by what you find here. See that blue behind me? That lake back there? It's called Lake Eling, and it's particularly significant because it's. Well, I'll have to show you in a picture. See, like if this were Lake Eling, Eling. See, the waters of the Yellow River flow into it, and then they unify here, and they flow out as one river. It's called the Yellow River. And the Yellow River is also known as the Mother River of Chinese civilization. You can see it running along over there. The source of the Yellow River is surprisingly peaceful and clear. Later, its waters are notably wild and turbulent, but their origin could not be clearer or calmer. The Yellow River is the second longest river in China. From Qinghai, it passes through nine provinces and autonomous regions on its way to the Bohai Sea on the east coast. It gets its color from the yellow clay dust that is blown across China. It's a sediment that permeates China's long history. Princess Wencheng, having set out for Tibet from Chang'an, the Tang Dynasty capital, was met by her husband, the Tibetan king, at the source of the Yellow River. And next to me now is the Yellow River itself, the origin. I never expected it to be so clear and so blue. As a symbol of respect and honor towards the Yellow River, the Tibetans often place one of these nearby. I'll do the same. The Yellow River is the spiritual home of the Chinese people, and its source is protected by typical Tibetan yak horns. As we continue further, near the path are some of the prayer wheels that line the mountains. These multicolored flags have Buddhist blessings written on them, designed to spread well-being to the surrounding area. Each time the wind blows, it's said it's like the reading of the scriptures. Tibetans place these flags here to commemorate Princess Wencheng. On her journey to Tibet, she brought volumes of Buddhist sutras with her. She also brought the finest farming and industrial techniques from the Tang Dynasty. Having settled in, she taught the Tibetan people how to grow crops and vegetables, grind wheat, and make wine. In this way, she was instrumental in improving the lives of many Tibetans. Later on, when another Tang Dynasty princess, Jin Cheng, Passed by on her way to marry another Tibetan king, she ordered her craftsmen to build a temple in honor of Princess Wencheng. People in Tibet are grateful for what Princess Wencheng did for them. Still today, people come here to pray and ask for blessing. In their hearts, Princess Wencheng is like a flame that burns, quiet but strong. Yushu has its own place of mystery, the Ba Valley. Here, carved on the mountains and rocks, is the six-word mantra of Tibetan Buddhism, O Mani Be Me Hom. It reads, "The entire teachings of the Buddha are contained in this mantra." Not surprisingly, it can't be translated into a simple phrase. Repeating this mantra is believed to bring merit and ease the negative karma. Meditating upon it is believed to purify the mind and body. 
Tibetan Buddhism is associated with one of the world's most distinctive spiritual cultures. It's based on profound wisdom, and to these Tibetans, there's nothing more important than spiritual fulfillment and collecting good karma for the next life. So we finally arrived at Jiegu, capital of Yushu Prefecture. A must-see here is the Jiegu Monastery, located on top of a hill to the north. The monastery is famous for its magnificent structure, the number of its celebrated monks, and its rich collection of relics. Much of the monastery's fame is also attributed to its first living Buddha. Inside, the monastery comes alive with golden statues adorned with white scarves by respectful worshippers and colorful paintings of Tibetan deities. If you ask people to choose one location as the unifying point for everyone in the town, it would probably be this temple back there. You see, it's located high above the mountains, and it overlooks the entire town and protects every single person here, blessing them. Yushu is one of the most remote areas where Tibetans live. The population is over 90% Tibetan. Devout worshippers will come inside the monastery and place spoonfuls of vegetable fat in lamps to keep the sacred flames burning. Worshippers still make the traditional clockwise round around the temples, spitting their handheld prayer wheels with each step. Every morning, a lot of the local people, both young and old, they come to this place right here and spin these prayer wheels. Now they're called so because inside there are the scriptures, and spinning them clockwise is like reading the prayers. Now some people decide to just push these along. Others also have a little handheld prayer wheel which they spin. And so others, they bow down on their hands and knees like this and prostrate. And over here, you can find these money stones. There's almost millions of them all layered up, each one with a blessing. That's a whole lot of stones. Just east of Diego Monastery, there's a place that's considered miraculous, a Mani stone compound. This is the world's largest collection of hand-carved prayer stones, more than two billion of them all told, piled on an area bigger than a football field. It was all started by the living Buddha Jiana. Inscribed on the stones are Buddhist carvings and the six-word mantra. Now the number of stones continues to grow, since pilgrims, having circled the pile, sometimes add a stone or two. Young and old, pilgrims are seen walking around here day after day. The most exciting time of year in Yushu is late July. That's when the horse racing festival is held. On the grasslands, tents brighten up the scene like stars covering the sky. People come from all over the world to take part in the celebrations. The local nomadic people camp out with their families, making the festival a great family gathering. But the highlight of the event, of course, is racing, and people bring their finest horses. Hey, buddy! Such a good boy. Are you gonna be in the racing? You gonna take home the championship? And you see, this is a typical family that's been out here, and they're going to be out here for around five days or so to enjoy the festivities. And every member has come along, the grandparents, the kids, and the grandchildren. You see, this is my favorite. 
item in the entire tent. It's the most valued item, and it's believed that it's been passed down from generation to generation. So its history could be over 100 years. This one, can you see? Can you see? Got to be careful. This is very religious and very holy item. It's called a prayer wheel, and it's spun like this in a in this manner. And inside are the Buddhist scriptures. It's believed that every time you spin it once. It's like reading the scriptures. Just proves how devoutly religious the people here are, doing this all day long. There are two types of tents: the black yarn ones and the white cloth ones. For the horse racing festival, people usually bring along the summertime white cloth tents. These are smaller, thinner, and more portable. On its outside, they're decorated with auspicious symbols or other religious signs. In fact, these mobile homes have become an art form in their own right. And besides their mobile homes, there's something else the Tibetans bring with them: man's best friend. That's right, the Tibetan mastiff is a real friend. Here, they may look like lovable dopey balls of fur. But watch out, because they are easily transformed into some of the fiercest dogs known to man, faithful and utterly fearless. These huge animals, weighing up to 113 kilograms, used to live in the wild mountains of Tibet, where they were first domesticated 6,000 years ago. See that beast over there? That is a pretty big dog. It's one of the largest breeds. Can I get close to it? Okay, good boy. See, at the、uh, horse racing festival, a lot of Tibetans come here and showcase their their pets as well, like this very typical dog. But the temperament of this dog is, by nature, very aggressive. So, although this one has been specially trained, the ones over there, there. There, 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 everywhere. They will probably bite you, so don't get too close. You're an exception, huh? These beasts don't come cheap either. Top dogs cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Ah, you see. Here the weather is really cold in the at night and early in the morning, and really hot in the afternoon and also around noon time. So they wear these coats here and many layers, you see. And this part is made of I think wool, and it's very very warm. But it's so complicated to put on that I don't think I could do this by myself. I need them to help me. During the festival, Tibetans dress in their finest. Since they are nomadic people, they carry their valuables with them. Much of it in the form of jewelry or other accessories. Men and women alike wear their long hair and cover themselves in ornaments made of silver, gold, pearls, and jade. A Kamba woman, in her formal dress. Can be wearing jewelry worth several hundred thousand, even a million yuan. Yushu in Qinghai is known as the land of song and dance. Back in the 18th century, the Living Buddha of the Jiegu Monastery created many of the dances. Making your sleeves sway is an important part of the dance. The sense of festivity is enhanced by the ringing of the foot bells. And the swinging of the sleeves makes them appear like they're swaying and swinging in the air. I see. This is the real Tibetan dance, and you see, the skill is all in the sleeves right here. And they swing it back and forth, and you see the spirit they have. It's very free will, just like the environment here.
the horse racing festival is not an exclusive holiday for the Tibetans of Yushu. People come from Gansu, Tibet itself, and other parts of Qinghai, Yunnan, and Sichuan to take part in the festivities. Now, though they are all Tibetans, coming from different regions, they dress in a rich variety of costumes. But there are common features: the wide waist, long sleeves, long apron, and high boots. Also, the men and women are decked out in jewels and their most prized possessions. They're certainly not shy about displaying their wealth. <laughs> Men and women together dance, but you see, it's the men who show off many of their moves. Tibetan men are agile dancers and sometimes quite fierce. They incorporate aspects of their daily life into their movements, so their dancing gives us a hint of the rough, brave nature of Tibetan men. It said Tibetans learn to dance as soon as they can toddle, and learn to sing as soon as they can gurgle. So here we are at the big finish line. This is where it all happens right now. You see, all the contestants are getting ready to start their horses, and some of the contestants are even like little kids. They're like 11, 10 years old, ready on their horses because they're lightweight jockeys, right? And you see, they're lined up. They're all dressed up, and the horses, I bet, are even nervous and excited. We'll see who the winner is. The highlight of the festival is the horse racing, of course, and it's common to see young children riding on horseback. They start learning to ride at an early age and rapidly become quite skilled. Many of the young riders dress in white, the color that is most holy, representing purity and loyalty. Qinghai is sparsely populated. But during the horse racing festival, the small town of Yushu is crowded with hordes of people wanting to witness the climax: the singing and dancing, the costume shows, and the horse racing. The festival is five days of fun and excitement. It's a time when Tibetans, in their own unique way, pray to the gods and entertain themselves as well. Horse racing here starts back more than 500 years. According to Tibetan legend, King Gesar was much admired for his horsemanship. Later, horse racing became a great spectacle when men showed off their courage. By tradition, Tibetans regard the horse as a symbol of good fortune, courage, and intelligence. By contrast, with the excitement of the horse race, the yak race is far more amusing. And they're off, but they're not horses; they're yaks. Because you show is actually the home of the yaks. And you see the guy in the front? Look how fast he's going! That yak. He's trained with a rider. More exciting than a than a horse race. See, and, and most interesting is there's always one guy in the back who's sort of just taking his time, doing his thing. He's just rolling along, rolling, rolling. Hurry up, man! <laughs> Dotted with black and white tents, the grassland roll endlessly into the distance. Mingling with the whispering wind are the sounds of racing horse hooves. There, there's the figure of a handsome and brave young man. 
Behind him is a Tibetan girl, her hair adorned with precious jewels, her face pure and bright. Onward they gallop to where nobody knows. That is Qinghai. I think this is probably the most representative scene here in Yushu. Amongst the grazing goats and the yaks and the mountains in the plateau, I think the Tibetans have it all. Well, thanks for watching Travelogs S.P. Minority Special, and I'm going to go have some fun with my buddy. See you next time.